of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It has been said that the will to win is nothing without the will to prepare. Just think of how many of us wish for and pray for something, but without giving much thought to actually preparing for it. Millions of people purchase Powerball lottery tickets when the jackpot goes up to hundreds of millions of dollars. But it's a safe bet that very few of us are at the same time studying the tools of financial management we would need in order not to be destroyed by that much sudden wealth. Lent is preparation for an encounter with God, an encounter conferred to us in Holy Week and Pascha. And in fact, the 40 days of the fast constitute training for a meeting that will, if we are not ready for it, be too much for us. This is because when we encounter God, when we experience a theophany, we always receive, at the very same time, an anointing with the Holy Spirit. And the anointing which the Holy Spirit confers is always twofold, or dual. It is twofold since on the one hand, to receive the Holy Spirit is to be imprinted with a royal dignity. Yet on the other hand, to receive such grace is to be marked out and set aside as a worthy offering to God. In other words, anointing by the Holy Spirit makes us a king or a queen, but it also makes us a sacrificial lamb. And this duality within anointing, if we are not prepared for it, will always be too much for us to handle. When grace hits us with that much force, we will either waste it because we don't notice it, or become deluded and think that we have suddenly become saints, or we will despair at the sight of our own sinfulness, or we will turn away from the grace because of the crosses it imparts. Even so, Lent is the Church's way of readying us for the Theophany of Holy Week and Pascha, and indeed of Pentecost, and readying us for the anointing which they confer. And so our Holy Church places the Sunday of the veneration of the cross right here in the middle of the fast to at once console us and yet remind us that the days for preparation are passing. Now, we all know that everything which the Church does, all that she says and teaches, her every commemoration and the every breath of her divine human life have one single purpose, and that purpose is love. Love is the main thing. And the Church, whether loudly or softly, explicitly or implicitly, and in fact in every way possible, is trying to wake us up before we die to get us to open our eyes and to get our heads into this game, the great game of love. Now, if love is the thing, then the cross is the revelation of what actual love looks like. For love always involves a cost, and even though love always repays that cost a hundredfold and more, still, love is inseparable from tears, from sorrow, from sacrifice, Love is inseparable from long nights of vigil in church, or long nights spent beside the bed of a sick child, or spent praying and crying out to God on behalf of a loved one away in combat, or the thousands of other forms in which love inevitably crucifies not only our egos, but transforms our very selves. Of course, there is no successful person in this world, whether public service, the caring professions, in business or in sports, who has achieved that success except through a million acts of self-denial, self-offering, self-discipline. And there is no person on this earth who does not carry a cross of some kind. But the cross which Christ confers is far more than all these crosses. It is far harder, far more complete. It is more consoling, yes, but it penetrates so much deeper because it is a far more life-giving and more triumphant cross. Less than three weeks from today, on the Friday before the Saturday of Lazarus, the 40 days of Lent will end. We will then enter a two-day interstitial period of resurrection and triumph. And then it's on to Sunday night of Holy Week, where we darken the lights and plunge into a participation in those great and holy days that recreated the world. The fact is, three weeks from now, we will meet God 
as we walk alongside the only begotten Son of the Father in those moments when his anointing by the All-Holy Spirit was completed in his flesh. In these days, therefore, the mutual love at the center of the Trinity is revealed, and God is revealed in all his majesty and humility, in his purpose, in his focus on our salvation. If we prepare correctly, then our hearts will be open to the holiness of the joyful sorrow of the Holy Week encounter, the twofold anointing by the Holy Spirit, which renders us at the same time both kings and sacrificial lambs. So let us use these remaining days to prepare for the encounter with God. To fast, for by weakening our attachment to the body, we can receive God in chastity. To give alms, for by turning our economic lives away from competition and jealousy and towards mutuality and sharing, we can welcome the crucified God in a spirit of long suffering. And to pray, for by communing with God now, we can welcome that more ultimate communion with him that is granted through his resurrection. Millions of our spiritual ancestors have walked before us in this path, and none of us can say for sure that next year will be given to us. Through the power of thy cross, O Christ our God, preserve us also from the temptations of the evil one, and make us worthy to venerate thy divine passion and life-bearing resurrection having radiantly traversed the great length of the fast, and have mercy on us as thou art good and lovest mankind. Amen. Wishing you a blessed Lent on behalf of the faculty of Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology, I bid you farewell.